Well, good morning. So welcome to the 2024 Future Warfighting Symposium. Again, I'm Captain James Guimond, and on behalf of the Naval War College, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event. So this is a fantastic time to be alive, and it's a fantastic time to be alive and involved in our profession. The world is changing, and this symposium is designed to help us think about some of those changes that, are, that have arrived today and that will come in the future. The ability to innovate faster and better is the foundation on which military, economic, and cultural power now rest. The Future Warfighting Symposium answers the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs' call for greater attention to strategic deterrence and emerging or disruptive technologies, including cyber, space, AI, and deterrence. So over the next two days, you'll hear from a group, a distinguished group of speakers and panelists, and they'll present their perspectives on the future challenges confronting our militaries and societies. These conversations will ask you to consider which innovations, together with allies and partners, will enable us to maintain the competitive advantage that will ensure victory in future wars. The symposium, symposium's events will offer you uh, the unique opportunity to pose tough and thoughtful questions to our panel of experts and gain insight into future warfighting challenges and to develop areas of research that you may wish to explore during your time here at the Naval War College. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Naval War College. Please welcome Rear Admiral Peter Garvin. Well, good morning. All right, everybody's awake. That's great. I, I can't say that necessarily for myself, because in addition to all the weather challenges that prevented some of our panelists from making in until the very wee hours, or some not at all, um, we decided that we would test the fire alarm at quarters AA for several hours in the middle of the night. So if I go a little goofy on you, uh, my apologies. Uh, but anyway, it is a fine Navy day, and it is a great way to start off the new year. I was just talking with our first keynote speaker where you come from, what you've been doing the last several months, years, and then coming to this place where you open your minds to the other things that have been going on around the world, and then looking at the instruments of power and the strategic frameworks that you are going to be able to apply to those things. I, I think this will be one of the most rewarding, most fulfilling, and probably one of the most challenging years of your career thus far. So it's great to see shipmates like Admiral Tim White. Great to see you, sir. Um, in the audience, and Heidi Berg was supposed to be with us, but I think she's in Zoom land now because of the, the plane trains and monobobiles last night. And thank you to all the speakers and panelists for your participation uh, today. And it's always great to see our, our CNO distinguished fellows, Admiral Sanas, Admiral Verma. It's good to see you. I don't see Admiral Brer as he here today. He's probably in the back there somewhere. Thank you for your contribution to the Naval War College and our Navy. And from the Naval War College Foundation, President and CEO George Lang, Thank you for the incredible support of our Naval War College mission, providing the college what some deem the margin of excellence, or as I like to say, going from good to great. Provosts, deans, faculties, chairs, but most importantly, our students. It's an exciting day. The Future Warfighting Symposium is the first major event every year. We come together to gather subject matter experts and address several topics identified by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as special areas of emphasis for professional military education. We introduce cutting edge topics to prepare students to be better leaders in complex operational and strategic environments. And we support the National Defense Strategy and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Officer Professional Military Education Program, OPMEP, by challenging Naval War College students to think innovatively about new capabilities and domains that are changing the character of war. As you went through the required readings for today, you were also setting the foundation for our new Perspectives in Modern War course. And of course, you learned a little bit more about that yesterday, and you can find more on our website at the hyperlink to the course syllabus. So as we begin this academic year, our 140th at the United States Naval War College, it feels a little bit like the opening of a track meet, but with much more at stake. The mandate couldn't be more clear. The sense of urgency couldn't be more pressing. And the consequences of not rising to the occasion could not be more stark. 
Over the next two days, we will have great speakers with vibrant discussions with phenomenal panels on the topics of conflict and competition in cyberspace, competition in the space domain, artificial intelligence and data analytics, and deterrence in the 21st century. My charge to you this day and in future events is simply participate fully. Invest in the program. This race we're about to run is not for you alone or even collectively, but for the future of the international rules-based order we've enjoyed since the end of World War II. So come out of the block strong into the rest of the year. Next, I want to introduce and welcome our keynote speaker. Max Brooks is an American author with a unique relationship with the Department of Defense, leveraging his expertise in apocalyptic scenarios and survival tactics to offer insights into real-world strategy and resilience. His work, particularly one of my favorites, World War Z and the Zombie Survival Guide, has been used by military personnel as a creative framework to discuss strategies for dealing with catastrophic events. He has participated in think tanks and spoken at military institutions, sharing his knowledge on crisis management and emphasizing adaptability, resilience, and innovative thinking in preparing for future conflict. Max highlights the need for comprehensive preparedness plans that encompass both conventional and unconventional threats, and stresses the importance of emerging technologies and international cooperation in addressing global security challenges. Overall, his message encourages military leaders to anticipate and prepare for a broad spectrum of potential threats, fostering a culture of innovation and adaptability within our armed forces. So please join me in a warm Naval War College welcome for Mr. Max Brooks. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> if I seem a little loopy, it's because I was part of that weather incident. <clears throat> but, um, you know, you and the Navy don't know anything about lack of sleep, so. Uh... <clears throat> uh, the first time I was here was a long time ago, and I think you can still find it on YouTube, where I'm standing there, flop sweating, asking, uh, are you sure you got the right guy? Uh, there wasn't a, a mix-up at Bureau of Personnel, and there's some lieutenant commander, Max Brooks, wandering around Comic-Con saying, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Because <laughs> it's true, I'm not, I'm not a sailor. I'm not uh, DOD or CIA or EIEIO. Uh, <laughs> I'm just a storyteller. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to start by telling you all a story. And it's the story of the most disastrous war America has ever fought. And it's not Vietnam, not Iraq, not Afghanistan. It's Desert Storm. What? Wasn't Desert Storm a, a big win? Didn't we just annihilate the world's fifth largest army in 100 hours? Well, yeah. That was the good part. But the disaster came later in the lessons that we took from it and the lessons we inadvertently taught our enemies. Because let's be clear, Desert Storm was a war of deterrence. You can argue that it was, yes, we're backing up an ally and or no blood for oil. Or, but the real reason was the Cold War was winding down and a new age was dawning, and it was an American-led age of rules-based liberal democracies. Well, how do you protect that? How do you defend it? Well, the powers that be thought a really good idea was a show of strength, which is why, at the time, a brand new device called 24-hour cable news was invited to embed with our military to then show these images to everyone everywhere, 24-7, that if anyone challenged the United States of America on the field of battle, they would be utterly immolated. We thought we were teaching deterrence, but that's not what our enemies learned. They learned that if you do challenge America, don't go anywhere near the field of battle. Don't fight them on their terms. D 
develop alternative means, innovative means. We thought we were teaching deterrence. Instead, we were teaching the value of asymmetry. And they got to work on that as soon as the dust settled over those oil fields. And they are a generation ahead of us in all these alternative means, cyber, economic, proxy, information. Wow. Just to name a few. And more importantly, they have been weaving together these alternative means into a cohesive doctrine. And like I said, they're a generation ahead. And we've been seeing the bitter harvest of it in the last few years. Look at Ukraine. Russia's greatest weapon is not things that go boom. It's election meddling. Look at COVID, right there. It doesn't matter whether it came out of a lab or a wet market. That's a debate that should not be happening. The important part of COVID is that we in the West are so addicted to cheap Chinese sweatshop labor that makes the things that we think we need so badly that when COVID started, we didn't heed the warnings and we didn't pressure the Chinese Communist Party to open up and to figure out what really was going on, even though we knew this had happened before with SARS, which I based World War Z on. We didn't do it. No, 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 no. We need our stuff. And it got out and it killed more Americans than all of our wars combined. And it took a nuclear powered aircraft carrier off the sea. That has never happened before. A little teeny tiny germ. You could hear the ghost of Admiral Gorshkov saying, oh my God, are you kidding me? I bankrupted my whole nation building a surface fleet and now a germ did what I couldn't. Look at what's happening in the Middle East right now. The perfect example of asymmetric combined arms. Israel isn't just at war with Hamas. They're at war with Iran, which is using Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis. Proxy warfare combined with information warfare. Israel's using bullets and bombs. Hamas is using words and pictures. Which one do you think is having more of an effect on the global stage? And you want to talk about economic warfare? Uh, if I could just ask a show of hands, how many of you have friends right now in the Red Sea? Yeah. That's hardcore economic warfare right now on two levels, not just because they're trying to choke off a valuable economic lifeline, but because Look at the drones and missiles they're shooting and look at what we're using to shoot them down. Just look at the cost and break down the dollar value into some sort of civilian worth, right? Think about that. Think about what those drones and missiles are costing in civilian dollars and what we're using in civilian dollars to shoot them down. That basically boils down to Every time they shoot a really nice pair of sneakers at us, we hit it with a four bedroom house. That is not sustainable. And they know this. They know that they are bleeding us and they can keep doing it. They are ahead of us and we need to catch up. We need to innovate. This is why places like this are so critical one of the most critical institutions we have in one of the most critical times because we are in the interwar years. This has happened before where you're in a crossroads. In World War II, right before the late 30s, the exact same thing happened. You had two sides, one of which had been the winners and therefore had doubled down on how they won the last war versus the losers who were pushed, forced to be creative. And look at the results. The French had managed to defend their country in World War I with trench warfare. So they thought, well, next time we're gonna, we're gonna double down. 
We're going to build super trenches. We're going to build the Maginot Line. We. Oui. <laughs> As opposed to the Germans who thought, well, we're not going to assault the Maginot Line. We're going to go around it. And they didn't invent tanks, because part of innovation is not just inventing new tools, it's inventing new ways to use old tools. Tanks had been very popular in World War I, but they had been used willy-nilly as mobile pillboxes. It took a Heinz Guderian to say, no, 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 I'm going to take all of the tanks and put them together in the Panzer Division. And we're going to move very fast like lightning, lightning war. Likewise, at sea, the German high seas fleet had fought the British Grand Fleet in Jutland, and somehow some crusty old German admirals like Raider, they were still hoping for a Jutland 2.0. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. We're going to build the Turpets and the Bismarck, and it's just, oh, it's going to be just wunderbar. As opposed to a younger former U boat commander, Admiral Dernitz, who said, no, no, boss. <clears throat> We're never going to do a Jutland 2.0. Stop trying to fight the enemy on their terms. By the way, we lost Jutland. The next time we come out, let's just acknowledge Britannia rules the waves. So let's go under the waves in a fleet of U-boats. In the late 1930s, the winners, just like we did in the 1990s, fell victim to the winner's curse doubling down on what worked in the last war, thinking, hoping, magically wishing that somehow the next war would be a replay. And in World War II, just like today, on the innovation scale, the enemy was a generation ahead. So we need to correct this. That's the bad news. The good news is we can. Because if history teaches anything, it can teach us hope. The United States Navy's finest hour was not, I don't know, something with John Paul Jones or Midway. The United States Navy's finest hour was December 8th, 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor. Because they did something that no one expected them to do. They pivoted from what should have been a fatal knockout. They should have froze. They should have collapsed psychologically, but they didn't, even though that had happened before in the war and was happening now. When the Germans went around the Maginot Line in Blitzkrieg, the French high command utterly crumbled, even though the French army was bigger than the German army and had more tanks. They couldn't pivot on the fly. They couldn't think on their feet. They surrendered, and they lost France. Likewise, in the Pacific, right after Pearl Harbor, the British High Command did the exact same thing with Singapore. Fortress Singapore, the Gibraltar of the East. They knew a war was coming, and they had planned for it, but all the guns faced the ocean. It never occurred to them that the Japanese would land behind Singapore and come through the jungle. There was no plan for that. And then, you want to talk about innovation, the Japanese army used tanks in a place where nobody thought tanks could go, and they even used bicycles, thousands of them, ripped off the rubber, rode on the rims, so they sounded like tanks. So it wasn't even just Logistics warfare was psychological warfare. What did the British do? Nothing. Even though the troops on the ground, the British, the Commonwealth troops, the Australians, all of them were like, please let us fight back. We can do this. We can stop them. Oh, no, 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 they can't do this. No, it's impossible because it's the jungle's impassable. It's impassable and impossible. Froze. And they lost Singapore and they lost their empire and they lost an entire world system that had been there for 100 years. And that should have happened to the US Navy. The US Navy is just as guilty of preparing for a battle that didn't happen. The US Navy had War Plan Orange, which was thought up right here. Anybody been, who's been to the war gaming room? 
You guys got to check it out. It's amazing. There's a giant chessboard floor with a second floor wraparound balcony where the admirals of the day literally looked down and war gamed it out. But War Plan Orange was based on the battleship, the king of the ocean. And it was believed down to their bones that the way the battle was going to happen was you would use these weird new ships, the flat toppy aircraft carrier thingies, as the eyes of the fleet. And they would send out their little planes and they'd see the enemy fleet. Maybe they'd do a little pinprick strike. But the point is they would draw in the Japanese fleet to fight the American fleet, battleship versus battleship, and then it was going to be on. And then, oh, when the West Virginia and the California and the Arizona with those 14-inch guns got the Nagato in her sights, ah, it was going to be a slaughter. And it was. Because what happened was that the other side had innovated. A year before, the British Navy launched this weird, desperate aircraft carrier strike at the Italian fleet at Taranto. And in doing so, one aircraft carrier sank three Italian battleships. And this is a critical example of how human beings think. Most of the naval brass of the entire world looked at that as a one-off and said, oh, well, that's, that's, they got lucky, that was cute, whatever. Except for one guy, Lieutenant Commander Minuro Genda, of the Japanese Imperial Navy. He saw that, and he went to his boss, Yamamoto, and said, sir, I think we have a new way of warfare. I think we can scale this up. I think we can make the aircraft carrier the centerpiece of a whole new task force, and I think if we're gonna have to take out the American fleet, we're gonna do a much bigger Taranto. And to Yamamoto's credit, he went, all right, draw up some plans. Let's see if we can make this happen. And they did. December 7th, 1941. Should have paralyzed the US Navy, but it didn't. It galvanized them. They looked at what was left and said, okay, what do we got? <sighs> okay, well, we've got the aircraft carriers. Thank God they were out at sea and we've seen what carriers can do. All right, we can do that too. We can have a carrier task force. We can make that the centerpiece of the fleet. What else we got? Well, we got submarines. We've seen what Dernis's U-boats have been doing in the Atlantic all this time, almost strangling the island nation of Britain. We know who what else is an island nation? Japan. We can do that too. We obviously can't use wolf pack tactics out in the Pacific, but we can invent our own tactics. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna completely pivot and reinvent ourselves on the fly, and we're going to send our subs out into the Japanese empire and sink every merchant fleet we can find, while at the same time, we are gonna develop the carrier task force for the moment when we fight that decisive battle. And it turned out to be midway. That was the US Navy's finest hour. And it can happen again. And the good news, the even better news, is that it can happen again without having to go to war. Because we are now in the interwar years. This is the critical time when we can experiment, where we can learn. This is what you can do now. These are the lessons from history that you can take. Don't be afraid to be creative. Don't be afraid to have crazy, possibly stupid sounding ideas. Don't be afraid to listen to other guys like Minoru Genda. He didn't come up, like I said, with Pearl Harbor. He looked at Taranto and said, in the words of Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> and most importantly, most importantly, don't be afraid to champion other people's ideas. Because this is a common misconception. Uh, I, I'm a creative person for a living. That's what I do, that's how I feed my family. And I can tell you that in the creative process, uh, a common misconception is that uh, there are creative people and they're not creative people. It's not true. Looking at this room, you guys probably have as great ideas as I could ever have. But sometimes what's missing is the courage to champion those ideas. Have that courage even if it means risking your career and never getting that star. If somebody next to you has a great idea and you know it's a great idea, stand up for them, stand with them, 
and champion that because it has happened before. What I said before about Midway, the decisive battle that turned the course of World War II was based on nothing more than a gut feeling. The man that was supposed to command that carrier task force, Bull Halsey, was out of action. He was in the hospital with, well, we, we used to think it was a skin disease. We think now it's probably a nervous breakdown. Not his fault. It happens. But there he is in the hospital bed. This was the guy. And Nimitz comes to him and says, you know, Bull, who's going to replace you? And Halsey goes, race Bruins. And Nimitz, had he been a character in Family Guy, would have gone, whoa? Race Bruins? The guy who's never commanded even one aircraft carrier? The guy who doesn't even know how to fly an airplane? The cruiser commander? That race Bruins? You want to put the fate of the Western world in his hands? And Halsey goes, yep. I know him. He knows carrier tactics. I trust him. Trust me. And Nimitz did. That kind of trust, that kind of spine, you've all got that potential in you. You can innovate, all of you. The great ideas of tomorrow, the kind of ideas that are going to cause spinning heads and exploding bowels in Tehran and Moscow and Beijing are right here in this room. Historians will write about the ideas that you come up with in the following years. It is all possible because in the words of my father's World War II generation, we did it before and we can do it again. And at this point, I'm going to stop blathering and I want to invite James Gimon over here and we're going to have more of a conversation and then we're going to open the floor up to your questions. So thank you for letting me, blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> Which side are we? I'll be over here. All right. Well, thank you, Max. That was fantastic. Uh, Max, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your words, your inspiration, uh, particularly you. with uh, uh, the Foundations of American Values. Uh, I know that means a lot to all of us who serve. So, thank you. Max thank Brooks. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.